The field of machine learning has been making huge strides in the last few years, and we're finally getting to the point where it's somewhat easily accessible to most programmers. My goal is to get to the point where I can train my own models for microcontrollers, but for now, it's better to start with something like Keras to get an understanding of what's going on. Keras is probably the easiest way to get started with creating and training neural networks. It's a high-level API where you can construct full, deep networks in just a few lines of code. You can set it to use a number of different backends, including TensorFlow, Theano, and CNTK, although TensorFlow is likely the most popular right now. You can also set it so that it uses your CPU or your graphics card if you want to take advantage of the parallel processing to train models faster. The good news is that TensorFlow now comes with Keras, so we don't need to worry about configuring backends. The easiest way to install TensorFlow is to follow the instructions on TensorFlow's site to download and run a Docker image. I tested it on Ubuntu 16.04, so it works on some versions of Linux. I imagine it works on Mac OS, but I don't have a Mac to try it on. You'll want to install Docker first and make sure it's on at least version 19.03. If you want to run TensorFlow on your graphics card, you'll need access to an NVIDIA card and you'll need to install the latest NVIDIA drivers. Make sure you can run CUDA using the NVIDIA-SMI command. NVIDIA maintains a custom Docker engine that you'll need to install as well. Follow the instructions on this GitHub repo page to do that. You'll then want to use Docker to pull down the latest images from TensorFlow. Use the latest Pi 3 Jupyter tag to use TensorFlow with Python 3 and Jupyter Notebook. Add GPU in there to get the version that supports CUDA. Head to the TensorFlow Tags page on Docker Hub to see which tags you can use. Note that the order of the tags matters here. To run the Docker image and start Jupyter Notebook, call the docker run command. If you're using your graphics card for computations, you'll need to specify runtime equals NVIDIA. Add the IT flag for interactive mode and RM if you want Docker to do a clean when it exits. The V flag lets you map a directory from your host computer to the Docker image. I'll store my notebook files in a TF folder that I made. The P flag exposes ports and will need 8888 for Jupyter Notebook. Finally, we specify the image with flags. Leave off GPU if you plan to just use CPU mode. Once the Docker boots, it will start running Jupyter Notebook. It should print out an HTTP address in the console. Jupyter Notebook runs a web server that you'll have to connect to using this custom URL. Copy this address and paste it into a browser. If you're on Windows, the Docker image, at least the GPU version, won't work as of late 2019, so you'll need to install the CUDA toolkit manually. This installation guide on NVIDIA's site is the best tutorial for doing that. You'll need to install Visual Studio Express for the compiler. Then you can install the CUDA toolkit. Note that TensorFlow 2.0 only supports CUDA version 10.0 right now, at least for the Windows version. After that, install the QDNN library. You'll want to carefully follow the instructions in the documentation. It's a weird process of copying .dll and .h files from one folder to another. Then, I highly recommend installing Anaconda. It makes switching between different Python environments like CPU and GPU modes very easy. Just download the executable from anaconda.com and run it. Start the anaconda command prompt and create a new environment named TensorFlow. Switch to that environment with the activate command and install Jupyter Notebook and SciPy. Then you can just install TensorFlow with pip. Once you've installed the necessary NVIDIA drivers and CUDA libraries, you can create another environment, which I'll name TensorFlow-GPU. Activate it and install Jupyter Notebook and SciPy again. This time, use pip to install TensorFlow-GPU. Whenever you want to run TensorFlow, simply open the Anaconda prompt, enter conda activate TensorFlow or TensorFlow-GPU, and run Jupyter Notebook. Your browser should automatically open a page, but if not, copy the URL from the console and paste it into a new browser tab. Once you have Jupyter Notebook running, go into the directory where you like to keep your Python projects, which is document Python for me. I'll keep my TensorFlow projects separated into their own folder, so I'll go into that and select New Python 3 Notebook. If you've never used Jupyter Notebook before, it can be a little odd at first. The basic idea is that you can write snippets of code in cells and then run the cells individually. 
This allows you to try different chunks of code without needing to rerun your whole program, which can be a lifesaver if you're doing something like training a large neural network, which might take hours. As a quick test, we'll import TensorFlow and print the results of these two functions, is GPU available and is build with CUDA. The first tells us if TensorFlow can talk to our graphics card, and the second tells us if this version of TensorFlow was built with CUDA support. Press the Run button or press Shift-Enter to run the cell. If you're running a version of TensorFlow with GPU support, you should see true for both of these functions. If you're running with just CPU support, these will give you false. Don't worry if you just have CPU support on your machine. Most TensorFlow and Keras examples will run just the same, but training large models might take longer. You can save this example by clicking on the untitled notebook name and renaming the project. I'll call this one GPU-Test. Notebooks will autosave periodically, but to force a save, just click the Save button. Adding new cells can be done from the Insert menu, and click Edit Delete Cells to remove them. We're done with this notebook for now, so click Save, and exit out of the Browser tab. We're going to start with a simple linear regression example. Let's say we have a bunch of data that is related in a somewhat linear fashion like this. We're going to use Keras to fit a line to this data. That line, a simple mathematical equation, is our model, and we can use that model to make predictions. You might remember that the equation for a line looks like y equals a times x plus b. Another way to view this is a function, f of x is equal to a times x plus b. We can get an output of our function by substituting some value in for x. In machine learning, this linear equation is changed slightly so that we now have h of x equals theta 0 plus theta 1 times x. It's the same equation, but we're using theta to denote our weights instead of a and b. We're using h instead of f, as we call this the hypothesis function. During training, we use this function to create an output value, or hypothesis, based on inputs. If we know the actual output, we can use the difference between it and the hypothesized output to adjust the theta values. Let's say we train a model to fit our data here. We might end up with something like this for our theta values. Now, we can use this linear regression model to make predictions. If we substitute 1.1 for x, our model would give us 9.02. This point should be mostly consistent with the data that we fed into the model for training. You might use this type of model to help predict things like housing prices in an area, stock market trends, life expectancy in various countries, and so on. To use Keras for this, we first want to import Keras and a number of its associated modules. Specifically, we'll need models, layers, and optimizers. Finally, import NumPy as we'll need it to create lists of numbers and randomize some things. Next, we want to create some fake data for us to fit a line to. Linspace in NumPy just creates a list of numbers from the first argument to the second argument. The third argument tells Linspace how many steps to create that are evenly spaced between the two numbers. We'll then create our somewhat randomized true output data. I'm going to make it linearly dependent on whatever x is and add a small random number chosen from a Gaussian distribution. Since our data is small enough, we can print all x and y values to the screen to see what they look like. Notice that x just counts from 1 to 2 in small increments. y also increases linearly but isn't so neat in its counting. We can also plot these to see what that relationship looks like. If you do not have matplotlib installed, the easiest way to do that is from Jupyter Notebook. Simply enter exclamation point pip install matplotlib in a cell and run it. This will install matplotlib for your Python environment so you won't need to run it again unless you switch to a new environment or Docker image. Let's import pyplot and create a simple scatterplot of our values. We use the value k to change the color to black and a period to indicate that we want dots for our plot points. We use plt.show to actually create an image of the plot. Run the cell and you should see that our data is pretty linearly correlated. Next, we want to build an initial model, but let's talk about how Keras works first. Keras was designed to make creating neural networks much easier. We start by creating a handle to a model in code. We then add successive layers to that model, and we can specify a variety of traits for each layer, like the number of nodes in the layer, the size of the input arrays, and the activation function for each node. Keras will take care of connecting all the nodes for us, which saves us a lot of effort in coding. However, we're not going to be using a neural network. 
As it turns out, we can create a one-node neural network and tell it to have a linear activation function to create a linear regression model. A single node in a neural network essentially has this function. It takes one or more inputs and multiplies those inputs by a series of weights. These weights are usually represented by the Greek letter theta. It then takes the sum of all these weight times input values and adds a bias term. The bias term is just some constant and is usually written as theta zero. This sum is then fed into an activation function. The activation function acts to constrain the output of the node between two values. Commonly, you'll see a sigmoid activation function, which is a nonlinear function that takes some value and maps it to another number between 0 and 1. You'll also see the hyperbolic tangent function used, which maps the sum to a value between negative 1 and 1. There are other activation functions you can use, but they all act to constrain the output in some way, which is very useful when you have lots of interconnected nodes in a network. You'll rarely see a linear activation function used in a neural network, as it does nothing to constrain the output. If we use the linear activation, it's basically the same as having no activation function at all, since we could just make it multiply the sum by 1. In our case, we only have one input, so it's just one number, the weight, times our input, plus some bias term. If we rewrite this with the theta terms, we end up with the same linear equation we started with, this is how we can make Keras do linear regression for us. Back in our notebook, create a model variable and store a Keras sequential model to it. This will let us sequentially stack layers of nodes in the model. Next, we add our only layer. A dense layer just means that the output of every node in one layer is connected to the input of every node in the next layer. Since we have just one dimension in our input, the variable x, we set the input dimension to 1. Finally, we set the activation function to linear based on what we discussed earlier. If we print out the initial weights of the model, we can see that the slope, theta1, is set to some small random number, and the bias term, theta0, is set to 0. Next, we compile the model, which is just the Keras function for configuring the model for training. The optimizer tells the model which method it should use for updating weights in order to lower the error between the predicted value and the known output value. Stochastic Gradient Descent, or SGD, is a commonly used optimizer for neural networks, and it will work for our linear regression problem too. Gradient Descent is an iterative process that attempts to find the optimal values of the weights using partial derivatives in which the value of the cost, or loss function, is minimized. Stochastic Gradient Descent uses one or a few samples of data at a time when updating weights, rather than the whole training set of data. This makes the training process go much faster when dealing with large sets of data. The loss function tells the training algorithm how it should measure the difference between the expected output value and the actual value given by the training data. We'll be using mean squared error, or MSE. We can track how well the training is progressing by providing one or more metrics. In this case, we'll just track the MSE value. Finally, we train the model by calling model.fit. We provide it the input values in x and the actual output values in y. The batch size is how many samples are used for one iteration of gradient descent, which we'll leave at 1. One epoch occurs when all samples in the training data set have been used to update the weights. This could be several iterations of gradient descent if the batch size is less than the full training set size. You'll want to play around with batch size and epochs as they are considered hyperparameters that can affect how well a model is trained. I found that a batch size of 1 with around 50 epochs work well for training this model. You'll generally want to let Keras shuffle the data during training, but we can leave it off here. Run the cell and watch it train. You should see the MSE value decrease over time. If it doesn't, that means something is wrong with your model or hyperparameters. Once it's done, we have a fully trained linear regression model. We can use it to predict an output value based on some input. Let's give it the value 1.1, which is between the lowest and highest values in the training set, but doesn't necessarily appear in the training set. The model will compute the predicted y value on the line based on the provided x value. Speaking of the line, let's graph it on top of our data. We'll first create a set of corresponding predicted y values based on the initial set of x values that we produced. We'll use the same plotting functions as before, but we'll add a second set of arguments, which contain the same x's, 
but the predicted y's from our model, the b argument tells pyplot to draw a blue line connecting these points. As you can see, our predicted points create a line that appears to be in the middle of all of our data points. It seems like the model was a pretty good fit. Finally, if you'd like to see the slope and intercept for the line, just print out the model's weights. We can manually calculate the predicted value by multiplying the first weight by our input value and then adding the bias term. I hope this has helped you get familiar with Keras using a TensorFlow backend. The linear regression example is very simple, but it's a great way to start tinkering with Keras and see how it relates to neural networks. Happy hacking!